Last time we were talking about a cruise control example, and we had specifically looked at a proportional controller. Uh, so the transfer function of interest in this case was that from R of S, the reference input, to V of S, the speed of the car, which we're trying to control. Uh, we weren't worrying about disturbance inputs for the time. We were interested in this tracking problem, trying to design a controller, C of S, so that the output, V of S, tracks the reference input, R of S. And to do that by manipulating U of S, the control input, in this case probably a throttle input. And specifically, we we're going to design a controller, C of S, to manipulate that input on the basis of the error signal. So the input to the controller system was an error signal, which was just the difference between the reference input and the measured value of the speed. And then C of S is a transfer function that we can essentially choose in order to manipulate U of S so that V tracks R. And we tried using a proportional controller. We used this example to illustrate the step response of a standard first order system. And what we saw in that case was that uh, if we made our controller a so-called proportional controller, so-called because it generates a control input that is proportional to the error signal, then um, we found that we could, in principle, make the response as fast as we liked by choosing a large gain, a sufficiently large gain Kp. And in doing so, we also, in fact, made the final value of the step response. We could make it as close as we liked to 1 in the case of a unit step reference. So we could, um, we could make the steady state error, the steady state difference between the reference input and the speed, as small as we liked by making Kp bigger. But we couldn't make it zero. We could make it arbitrarily small, but not zero. And for this cruise control example, the reason is intuitively pretty clear. If we arrange so that in steady state, in the case of a step reference input, in steady state this error signal is zero, well that means that the throttle, the throttle input is going to be zero as well in steady state. But we have a friction term in our model of the vehicle, so if we apply no throttle then the vehicle is just going to slow down and we will have a non-zero error immediately. Uh, so it makes intuitive sense that in order to maintain um, the speed of the vehicle, we have to maintain some throttle input. And if we're just using a proportional controller, that means we have to have an error signal, a non-zero error signal. So the question we ended with was, how can we change this? Is it possible to design a controller so that the error signal can go to zero but the control input doesn't. And the idea that we're going to look at in this case is adding an integrator, putting an integrator in our controller. So let's try instead, instead of just multiply, multiplying the error by a constant Kp, Let's try integrating the error signal. So, we know that, we know that according to our differentiation and integration property of the Laplace transform, that at least in the case where initial conditions are all zero, integrating in the time domain corresponds to multiplying by 1 over s in the Laplace domain. So the transfer function of an integrator will be 1 over s. And of course, we may wish to multiply that by some gain, so I'll call this k sub i, the integral gain, if you like. So 
um, we can find the transfer function um, from R to V. We already did that, in fact. Let's do it for the general case where uh, the controller is just some arbitrary C of S. Then we know that V of S is going to be C of S times uh, P of S, the transfer function of the vehicle itself. I use P because it's customary in control to call the system that you're controlling the plant. And I think that terminology comes from chemical engineering, where they're interested in controlling chemical plants, essentially. So it's... Uh, we're going to take um, our error signal, multiply it by C of S, that will give us U of S, and then we'll multiply... Um, C of S by P of S. Um, I could have, of course, multiplication is commutative, so it doesn't matter in what order you write these things. Um, C of S, P of S is actually the common way of writing this down. Now, we're not really interested in the error signal, so we'll eliminate it with this equation, which just says that the error signal is generated by subtracting from the reference input the output signal. Actually, it's the measured value of the output signal, but we're just treating the speed as, as its measured value. So if we eliminate E from these two equations, uh, we get V of S equals C of S, P of S, times R of S minus V of S. And if we solve... For V, we then get C of S, P of S over 1 plus C of S, P of S times R of S. So the transfer function of interest, because it's the one that relates the reference input to the speed that's supposed to track that reference input, is this one. Um, C of S, P of S over 1 plus C of S, P of S. You'll see a lot of this transfer function in SE380. It's the typical formula, if you like, for the transfer function of a feedback control system of the form that we've just been looking at. So just as the, the poles of our, of our plant that we're trying to control are the roots of its denominator, uh, so the poles of this closed-loop system are essentially the zeros of 1 plus C of S, P of S. So this means that we don't have to settle for the poles of P of S. By choosing a suitable C of S, we can uh, get a transfer function that has uh, poles that we prefer that will lead to a better response. So we're going to go through that exercise. Why do I say that? In order to see what I've just been talking about, it's best to write out this transfer function in detail for our specific example. So our controller is just ki over s, ki times the integral. The plant transfer function is 1 over ms plus b. And then we divide that by 1 plus ki over s times 1 over ms plus b. So if I multiply both numerator and denominator by s times ms plus b, I get something a little simpler. And specifically, I'll get ki in the numerator over s times ms plus b. Plus ki. So whereas the denominator of the plant, or the characteristic polynomial of the plant, was just ms plus b, um, we now have s times ms plus b plus ki. So we're going to have different poles than we had just for the plant itself without the feedback loop built around it. Expanding this, we get ms squared plus bs plus ki. 
and you know, we may wish to divide through by m so that the leading coefficient of our denominator is 1, in which case we get ki over m divided by s squared plus b over m s plus ki over m. Okay. Now the first thing to note about this is that this does indeed is indeed going to solve our problem about the steady state value of the impulse response. Um, we're assuming that all of these constants are positive. So for now, assume that ki is greater than zero. We can, of course, choose ki. It's part of the controller transfer function. But if all of these are positive, then the two coefficients are positive. And all the three coefficients uh, in the uh, polynomial, uh, the characteristic polynomial, are positive. And for the case of a quadratic like this, when all of these coefficients are positive, the um, roots of the polynomial all lie to the left of the imaginary axis. So the poles of this transfer function all lie to the left of the imaginary axis. Then we can talk about the DC gain of the system. As we saw last time, the DC gain of a transfer function gives the final value of the step response provided all the poles of the transfer function lie to the left of the imaginary axis. Uh, so in this case, we simply get one unity. So if we feed a step into this system, if our reference input is a unit step, then the final value of the response is also going to be one. In other words, there will be no discrepancy between the desired speed and the actual speed in this case. We will have eliminated that steady state error that we had. So that's great, seeing as the objective is to get the speed to track the reference input, it will at least do that in steady state. So the car or the vehicle will eventually achieve the desired speed. In order to um, see what the transient response looks like, we're going to look in more detail at this transfer function. Um, this is a, um, an example of what we call the standard second-order system. So this transfer function, which we were calling... Um, what were we calling it? Sorry, H -D -V, uh, HRV. Is of the form of what we call the standard second order system. standard first order system last time. So we'll now look at the standard second order system. And then we'll see that we can extrapolate from these two examples to understand the responses of other systems with rational transfer functions. So the standard by the standard second order system, we mean this transfer function, I'll call it h of s, omega n squared over s squared plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. So we have two parameters for this transfer function, just as we did for the standard first order transfer function. In the first order case, they were the time constant and the DC gain. In this case, we know the DC gain is 1, so we don't have to worry about that. These other parameters, for reasons that will become apparent in the next lecture, are called 
the natural frequency. That's omega n. And this zeta is called the damping ratio. Okay, so seeing an example of the way this standard second order system transfer function can arise, we'll look at the responses of systems with this transfer function in the next lecture.